Okay. Well, um, I started my interest in, in marine mammals and whales when actually when I was about 10 years old, I went on my first whale watching trip. And um, I, that sort of stuck with me, my interest in marine mammals, and I've always been an ocean person. So when I started working at Point Lobos in 1980, uh, it was like I was a kid in a candy store. There were just so many marine mammals out there. I think we have like 27 marine mammals or maybe more in Monterey Bay that we can all go out and, um, and view. And uh, it's such a rich area that I just got so excited. I just started hitting the literature and I studied and studied and studied. And pretty soon I got so involved that I became the um, chapter president of the American Cetacean Society, the local chapter, and eventually uh, sat on the national board as well. Um, having Point Lobos be in my backyard certainly added to that, and then Monterey Bay, of course. Um, and when I first started at Point Lobos in 1980, uh, gray whales were really the only whales that we went out to see. Uh, blue whales were seen very seldom, and humpbacks really didn't make the scene until maybe 10 or so years ago in big numbers. So um, what we've got now though is whale watching pretty much all year long. It's certainly marine mammal watching all year long. Um, you can go out pretty much any day of the week. If you really put your mind to it, you probably can see a whale uh, with a few exceptions, of course. Uh, November's kind of slow. Um, in December as well, but by January, gray whales are coming down the coast. And then um, by uh, April, we're starting to see humpbacks. And then in the summertime, we're seeing blues. And um, a lot of other whales can be seen along the way as well. Um, the gray whale is a medium-sized whale. And um, it starts um, migrating down the coast in the fall when the pack ice begins to form. And I'll get into that a little bit later because there's some changes in the gray whale migration that are different than they used to be. And up until about 10 years ago, we could pretty much count on gray whales to come down the coast starting in January. And then we would see them uh, all the way up until say May. Uh, but now the migration is starting to get later and later each year. And unfortunately, it is due to global warming. Uh, the pack ice that they rely on up in the Arctic is uh, no longer there in the intensity that it was at one time. And the gray whales really need that pack ice because there's a mat of algae that forms underneath the algae uh, in the Arctic. And that algae eventually dies and rains down onto the bottom and feeds the bottom dwelling organisms. Those bottom dwelling organisms become food for gray whales. But with the Arctic ice moving north each year, a lot of the feeding areas that the gray whales depended on for gosh, a million years or so are no longer available and they have to move further and further north. And in doing so, it extends the migration south. And what we're seeing now is a, uh, a migration that's later each year and a migration that has a lot of whales that are not very healthy. Uh, we've had the last three years, there's been big die-offs in gray whales. It's because they just can't get into condition to migrate. Um, and a gray whale has to migrate all the way to the uh, down into the uh, lagoons of Baja under optimum circumstances to have a calf. And it'll have a calf down in the, in the lagoons and the mother will nurse that calf for uh, a couple, three months until it gets, uh, until it actually triples its body weight and is able to make the, the trip back into the, uh, back up to the Arctic. Uh, marine mammals have incredible um, uh, life histories and uh, gray whales while they're the calves are feeding in the lagoons they're putting on about eight pounds an hour believe it or not which is an incredible and other marine mammals uh, do similar things uh, the gray whale population now is probably less than twenty thousand, and it was delisted uh, a few years ago when the population went over 22 or 23,000. they thought that the gray whales in pretty good shape but I think it's going to have to be relisted again because of the, the die-offs. 
I'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. Um, um, I'm kind of skipping by some of this stuff here I, for some reason. Oh, well, okay. Um, and so anyway, gray whales, humpbacks, blues are all baleen whales. Uh, and all the baleen whales have a pair of blowholes. And the toothed whales, which are the orcas, dolphins, and porpoises, and the beaked whales, and bottlenose whales, and whatnot, all have teeth. But the baleen whales, the grays, and all the other great whales, except for the uh, sperm whale, which is a toothed whale, all have uh, a pair of blowholes and baleen. And uh, so, <clears throat> What is going on here? Huh. Okay. Okay, we're back on track. So baleen, for those of you that don't know it, is a substance like your fingernail, it's keratin. And uh, these baleen plates hang down from the roof of the mouth of the great whales. In this case, this is a gray whale baleen and it's short and stubby because when they feed, they're feeding on the bottom and they're going through the bottom and kind of scooping up big uh, amounts of mud and ooze. Uh, and then they push all that um, stuff that's not food out through the baleen plates and the food items are retained up against the baleen. So this would be the inside of the uh, baleen on the, on the uh, gray whales. Other whales have much, much longer baleen because they're feeding in the water column. They're out uh, sifting through uh, the water, looking for plankton and, and uh, euphosids and things like that. So the baleen of the gray whale uh, and a couple of others, like I'd say the minke are, are quite, quite short. Uh, if you go to the cabin and you look at the humpback whale baleen that's up against the edge of the whaler's cabin, uh, you can see that it's quite a bit longer and humpbacks uh, feed differently than gray whales. Gray whales are pretty much exclusively bottom feeders right now. Hopefully they can make a switch to find other food sources. But at the moment they are a bottom feeding whale and um, in need of a new uh, food source. Um, so this shows the pattern of the gray whales migration. It, uh, they, they feed up in the Arctic and this, uh, all this area up in here is the area that the gray whales would feed in. And then uh, come the fall when the pack ice is starting to, theoretically starting to uh, form again, they would start heading down the coast to uh, the lagoons of Baja. That's the traditional calving areas and nursing areas for the gray whale. Now, this year, many, many whales are born on migration. And so the the numbers of whales getting to the lagoons is, is less and less because the migration has changed so much. Um, so this migration, it starts in the fall and uh, they travel uh, day and night and get to the lagoons in about a couple of months. Then the, uh, under optimum circumstances, the calves are born and they nurse and then the mothers will escort their calves back up into the, into the Arctic. Um, this is all changing slightly, but uh, well, it's, it's actually kind of um, an animal that we can really watch to see how climate change affects. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad deal. But uh, animals are resilient and um, I'm, I imagine that gray whales will, will make that switch uh, to some other food source. There were three distinct populations of gray whales at one time in the world. There was an Arctic, pop, the Arctic population, the Eastern population that we see now. And then there was a group in the uh, Western Pacific uh, over in Russia. Um, and that group had up until about 10 years ago, I don't know what the population is now. They have about 130 animals uh, in the Russian population. And then in the Atlantic Ocean, there was a, uh, a group of gray whales that um, probably went across the Bering Straits into the Arctic uh, at a time similar to or into the uh, Atlantic, 
probably in a time similar to this when there was uh, no pack ice and they could go over and they started a population over there. But by 1800, the gray whale population in the Atlantic was decimated by whalers. Um, and whaling has been a big part of uh, the, the whole scene for a long, long time. Unfortunately, gray whales and other whales were the energy source of the day a long time ago. And the whalers would harvest these whales, uh, take, get the blubber, melt it down into whale oil. And then uh, pioneers learned to read and write with gray whale um, oil and other uh, whale oil, sperm whale oil being the best. Well, after their migration uh, and they link up, the uh, young animals are born. These young animals, young gray whale calves are born pretty much without blubber. Uh, and so it's necessary that they're at least in water a lot warmer than the Arctic. The Arctic uh, can be anywhere from 28 degrees on up to 40. Uh, 28 degree water is pretty tough on a young whale. So ideally they're born at least on migration so that they'll they'll do better. Um, these whales, when they're about 12 to 15 feet long, um, put on incredible amounts of weight. Uh, they'll put on eight, up to eight pounds an hour, they say, and triple their body weights before the lagoon, they leave the lagoon. So they might weigh around 4,500 pounds before they start the trip back up into the Arctic. And um, when I say these are marine mammals, they are marine mammals. They are fully aquatic, but they still have hair in some cases. Like you can see these little follicles on the upper rostrum of this little gray whale calf. And those are hairs, hair follicles. Um, all marine, all mammals have three ear bones and they have, they nurse their young and they're, they're warm blooded, which is a, uh, a typical thing of, of mammals. But a gray whale will eventually grow to about 50 feet in length under optimum circumstances and weigh in at a little less than a ton of foot. So a full grown gray whale female would probably live to be about 45 feet long, probably weigh in at around 40 tons. The males in all of the baleen whales are slightly smaller than the females. And so a full grown male would probably be around 42, 43 feet long, and again, weigh in a little less than a ton of foot. Uh, so they make, it makes the gray whales a medium sized whale. Um, humpback whales, which is another whale that we will see uh, in the summer times here at Point Lobos and in Monterey Bay, lately have been feeding on an abundance of anchovies. And so we've had humpbacks around for, uh, in the case of some of the juveniles all year long, which is another reason we can see whales all year long now in Monterey Bay. Humpback whales have been having a real feast on uh, anchovies and sardines and squid as well for some time. Uh, humpback whales are the whales that became kind of famous in Hawaii because they breach so much uh, and they're really spectacular. And up in Alaska and somewhat now down in Monterey Bay, they're known for their bubble netting, um, which they, had Tracy's screen share or whatever, or screen background is uh, humpback whales uh, full lunge feeding. And uh, they'll go down, a group of uh, whales will go down, usually led by a female, and they'll encircle their, their prey, which is uh, up in Alaska, it'd be herring down here, it'd be anchovies or sardines. And they will start to emit a chain of bubbles as they make this circle. And within that circle, the, the food, the prey, uh, balls up. And then at a certain time when the female signals it's time to go up, they all come up charging through the bait. And it's called lunch feeding. It, it's a spectacular thing to watch. Um, and humpbacks are not a huge whale, and they're not real fast, but they are 
very smart and they do a lot of jumping. They get up to about 53 feet in length, uh, way in at closer to a ton of foot than gray whales, but, but not very much. They have a distinct bump on the back that uh, is why they call them humpbacks. And they also have uh, characteristically uh, very long uh, pectoral fins that uh, you can see when they jump in particular. Uh, they like to jump for some reason, no one really knows why. But this makes the, this is, you can tell the difference between the uh, humpbacks and the gray whales, for one thing, by these long pectoral fins that they use for, uh, they slap the water with them, they herd their prey items with it, with them, and um, are pretty, pretty amazing. It's the only, the only whale that has those long pectoral fins. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is another, it's a baleen whale, and humpbacks, are in a group of whales like the blue whales called the rorque whales. And you can see these pleats that are on the underside of the, uh, the jaw of the, of the whales. These pleats can expand. In fact, these pleats can get to be the size of a, of a car. I mean, they can hold more water in the, in the um, mouth with the pleats expanded than they weigh. So once they come up, they have to push all the water out through the baleen plates and retain the food items. Um, humpbacks are much more versatile in their feeding than gray whales are. They're, gray whales are specialists on the bottom um, and humpbacks are not specialists at all. They'll feed on pretty much anything really. Their favorite foods are schooling fishes uh, and squid. Um, and they do a good job of feeding on them. Um, why, they, why they breach, no one really knows for sure. Uh, there's so much that's being learned about whales, but there's so much that we, we don't know. We just don't know the, the answers to a lot of the questions uh, because whales are hard to study. They're impossible to study almost under uh, most conditions because they're out at sea. Uh, however, in the Sea of Cortez, there's a lot of research going on down there, and they're learning quite a bit because it's a little bit easier to study them. But in Monterey Bay, research on whales is really, really tough, um, but it's getting better. Um, so the humpbacks that we see in Monterey Bay show up around April, and after that, they will take off and they'll head down the coast of California into Mexico. Uh, and a lot of whales are seen um, calving around Zihuatneo uh, and uh, Puerto Vallarta and places like that. Um, and so they'll travel down there uh, to those feeding grounds and calving grounds every year um, with some regularity. Um, one of the things that people often say about humpbacks here in California is that they go to Hawaii. Well, they, they don't. They don't go to Hawaii. They only go from, say, Washington, maybe Washington, as far north as Washington, down into Mexico. But the whales that go to Hawaii are the Alaskan humpbacks. And then the Alaskan humpbacks will head south to Hawaii. Uh, and start feeding down in, um, in the Hawaiian Islands and calving down there. It's an interesting journey because how they get there is um, anyone's guess. Uh, they, they might use the stars, they, they might use uh, subterranean noise or something, but how they got to the uh, Hawaiian Islands, who knows? Because during the whaling days, when the whalers were there uh, going after sperm whales, humpbacks were not seen there. And it wasn't until after the whaling days that humpbacks began to start showing up in Hawaii. How they got there and why is, uh, is incredible. Who knows? I don't know. No one does, but they, they certainly do. Um, so that's kind of a misnomer. There's a lot of misnomers that go along with marine mammals. Um, but uh, we're learning, we're, we're learning. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way here. 
keep doing this. So getting to uh, blue whales. Blue whales, as you guys probably all know, are the largest animal to ever live on the surface of the earth. And they feed on really small stuff, but they feed on a lot of that small stuff. Uh, blue whales can, be, can get up to 100 feet long. The ones that we see here in, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere probably don't get much over 90, 95 feet long. And the large whales, the huge gray blue whales uh, that were taken early in the 1900s uh, were from Antarctica. And the Antarctic uh, blue whales were much, much larger than any of the other blue whales found uh, throughout the world. The reason for that is probably because of the food that they were eating down there. They were feeding on euphosids a uh, big shrimp like uh, plankton or a um, yeah, big shrimp like uh, crustaceans, uh, which were maybe two or three inches long. Uh, the blue whales that feed around here are feeding on very tiny swarms of krill. Um, and you'll see that krill sometimes when you're out whale watching. But the reason that the blue whales that were so much bigger in the Antarctic, I think, is because of the food source. And, you know, once if you leave the whales alone long enough, they uh, will do pretty well on their own. Uh, but it's probably uh, that the whales that we had around here were all hunted out, too. And the Antarctic whales were might have, might have been safer. I'm not sure. But as I mentioned before, these are, blue whales are are specialists on krill. And krill is very small stuff. And the biggest animal in the world, weighing up to 150 tons, feeds on krill. The, um, the baleen that we have floating around in Point Lobos these days is from a, a blue whale that came ashore down at uh, Point Sur. And I was able to go down there and harvest a bunch of the baleen out of it in the mid 80s. Uh, and that whale was a 67 foot blue whale male uh, that had uh, theoretically newly been newly weaned. They start to, they're weaned at around 65 feet long. You can imagine a whale being weaned at 65 feet. Uh, that's what they are. And we know it was a male because the penis was extruding out of the body. And the whale was probably hit by a ship. And actually, if you go up to the top of the Point Sir Lighthouse, you'll see the skull of that whale uh, that uh, they were able to take up with the helicopter and they, they dropped it off up on top of the, the lighthouse there. So it's kind of a cool thing. Um, but blue whales um, are really not seen around here all that much until we have krill uh, in the bay. And blue whales uh, are able to emit these sounds that are very low frequently, frequency sounds that can be heard hundreds of miles away. So they send these scouts out uh, and they'll come up into the bay. They'll be looking for food or up in the Northern California area. If they find food, they can send information in the way of uh, guttural low frequency sounds to the other blue whales that might be waiting to hear that information. Um, and so they will all come up. The blue whales can travel at incredible speeds up to 25 miles an hour. Um, and so it doesn't take them a whole long time to, to be able to get up, you know, uh, maybe half a day to get up to, um, from here to say central California. Uh, there's a lot of feeding of blue whales that goes on down in the Channel Islands. And in the summer, uh, we have the most robust population of blue whales in California of any place in the world. Uh, and you can see a lot of them down in the Channel Islands. And you can also see a lot of blue whales around here um, in the summer when there's quill, krill around. Uh, everything is dependent upon krill. Um, Humpbacks will feed on that krill as well. And so if you go out looking for blue whales, there's a good chance you'll see krill also. And krill is very nutritious, very, very nutritious, a lot of oil. And so it's a very prized uh, form of food. 
And blue whales might feed on, you know, a ton or so of krill every day. Uh, and they have to continue to feed on a daily basis throughout their whole lives. So life in the ocean is really not very easy for them. But nevertheless, the blue whale population uh, is expanding worldwide. And because of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, a lot of whale um, species are becoming more and more popular um, uh, or populous. Um, like I said, when I first got to Point Lobos in 1980, we rarely saw blue whales. Now you can almost count on seeing some blue whales every year in Monterey. Um, as well as the other whales that we see. So those are th three of the um, baleen whales, the great whales that we see uh, here in, in Monterey Bay uh, pretty much every year and we can count on them. The gray whale is uh, not as easy as it was to see a few years back, but it's still one that we can count on every year. They're going by right now. They will be going by again until May when the cow-calf pairs come back through. The female gray whales will uh, come back through Monterey Bay uh, late in the spring as they head back up to the Arctic. So that's a, a separate phase of the migration, the females with, um, with the calves. Blue whales are all born down in the um, Central uh, America area. Uh, off of uh, Nicaragua and off of Costa Rica, a place called the uh, Costa Rica Dome, I think it's called, but a lot of blue whales are, are seen down there. Uh, we don't know of any whales actually that calve in Monterey. Uh, it's all done elsewhere. Gray whales, all, all whales migrate pretty much, except for one stock of fin whales in the Sea of Cortez that are there all year. We see fin whales here too, uh, but not as regularly as we see blue whales. They're the second largest animal to ever live on the surface of the earth. Fin whales, their diet is much more varied than blue whales who are totally specialists. So I'm gonna uh, move on uh, to uh, orcas, which is another uh, kind of a whale that we often will see around these parts. Um, but it is actually not a whale. Um, orcas are uh, actually, uh, well, here's the beautiful blue whale tail. Uh, orcas are actually a big dolphin. Before I get to that though, I wanna talk a little bit about whaling because whaling has been a huge part of um, of the whale's life actually, because whaling was um, uh, done from probably the mid 1700s up until now, really. Uh, and at Point Lobos, we had an on-site um, whaling station, a shore whaling station. And this is a, a, I'm trying to get rid of, I don't know if everybody sees this bar going across my screen, but I do and it's bugging me. I'm not sure how to get rid of it. Anyway, um, um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Um, Scammon, who became a naturalist in his later years, uh, was responsible for the decimation of gray whales uh, early on, he was a man. He was able to find his way into the lagoons down in Baja before everybody else did, and he just slaughtered whales for years until some other whalers actually followed him down there and figured out how he went into the lagoons. Once that happened, dozens of whale boats went into the lagoons and really brought the gray whale population to its knees. It was nearly exterminated. Uh, but whaling persisted. Uh, the American whale fisheries shifted to other whales, but the gray whale, um, gray whale uh, fishery turned to shore whaling. And Point Lobos was one of 16 shore whaling spots that we had up and down the coast. Uh, probably the most picturesque, according to Scammon, 
was Point Lobos. And uh, we're lucky at Point Lobos to be able to interpret an on-site shore whaling station. Um, I went back east and looked at some whaling museums on the East Coast in the early 90s. I came back and I talked to Point Lo uh, Kurt Loesch uh, about opening up the garage uh, as a, uh, a whaling station. And so we got busy, we did that. And uh, it's one of the only places in California or on the West Coast that interprets uh, shore whaling or, or whaling uh, in the way that we do. There's one other place in uh, San Pedro that has a, a, a pretty good display, nothing like ours, but it's, it's pretty good. They actually have a whale boat down there, which is unusual. They're, they have the only whale boat in, on the West Coast that I know of. Uh, Whaling museums on the East Coast are, are pretty amazing places to go visit. And whaling was the energy source of the day many years ago. And it's the reason that whales were hunted to near extinction is for their whale oil and their blubber, um, baleen and, and things of that nature. Um, what's happening here? Okay. Um, this is where the whales were flinched out in Whaler's Cove. They were brought into Whaler's Cove and uh, pulled up onto the, the ramp there and turned over as they were flinched out. And then uh, after they were flinched out, uh, they were cut up into pieces and thrown into tripods. And the tripods melted down the blubber. And there's a group of tripods at the Whaler's Cabin now that you can see that I, I believe were used at Point Lobos. So once the uh, whale oil was uh, harvested, it was shipped off uh, around the world probably. Hmm. Okay. All right, so this uh, is a little out of sequence there. But uh, orcas uh, can be seen here uh, pretty often around Around the, around the year, whale orcas will show up um, from time to time. There's a group called the uh, transients, the California transients or LA transients that go up and down the coast. Uh, our transient orcas here in Monterey uh, are stealth hunters that feed pretty much on, on everything. The orcas that we have up in the Puget Sound are what they call residents, and they feed primarily on salmon, um, if not exclusively on salmon. And uh, the residents up there are dependent upon dwindling salmon numbers. And so the orcas up in the Puget Sound are having a heck of a time uh, surviving. Uh, down here, they do a little bit better. Um, but not a whole lot better, but they're, they're doing okay. Um, and orcas are, are really just a big dolphin. Uh, they get up to 30 feet long. They are stealth hunters. There's really nothing in the animal kingdom that competes with orcas uh, in the ocean. They're the top of the food chain. They uh, even eat white sharks, which uh, sets them apart from a lot of other animals. Um, and they, down here, they'll feed on seals, um, whales, unfortunately, a lot of gray whale calves are taken every spring by orcas. Um, and it's a sad thing to watch gray whales calves being eaten by an orca when you've been down in the lagoons of Baja uh, with gray whale calves coming up to your boat and you can pet them. I always cringe every spring when the gray whales are coming by with their calves, hoping that they're gonna make it back up there. But uh, these orcas, as I mentioned, are stealth hunters. They're very, very, very intelligent animals, uh, stealth hunters that, um, um, you know, they keep the population of whales in check. You know, it's, it's just a, a necessary thing that they 